reform impact my business, my employees, and collectively our families. Additionally, you know, what should my business consider for upcoming renewals? We recognize that not all businesses have had a renewal since the reform was implemented. Uh, there might be some midstream impacts, but regardless, as your renewal comes up, what are some things you can start thinking about and, and considering now for that upcoming auto renewal? Also, we'd like to mention, you know, we want to answer all of your questions today and we want to answer them as they come in. So please feel free to chat them. Uh, we will, you know, just kind of answer those as they come along and keep it pretty casual and conversational. So, uh, Julie, we jump to the next slide. Of course. If it lets me, there we go. Yep. Just a couple of overview items. So we're going to achieve the objectives we just talked about by talking about the changes to auto liability coverage limits the changes to the property protection insurance. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is too. Sometimes it's, it's an overlooked piece of your, your auto, commercial auto policy. And then of course, we'll address the long anticipated change that offers new choices in medical benefits coverage under PIP. We probably talked a little bit about this uh, with, with your personal auto policy, but again, we're gonna shift gears and, and talk about this from a, a commercial focus. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch things over to Kelly to, to dive in. Okay, and today we thought a good place to start would be the forms that you might see um, with your, your agent or your account manager that you might work with on your business personal policy and the forms that you might see that come in uh, maybe even before you start your renewal process. First, we have auto leaseback agreements and that is for typically the either um, an owner or an account executive that might be using their personal autos within the business realm. And in order to have insurable interest to be on your business policy, if your auto is titled to you personally, you can lease it back to the company. So that's just a simple form that we have that you sign off on that says uh, we can put that auto on that business policy. Uh, in addition, a lot of the carriers or again, your account manager or your agent might send you a PIP limit um, election form as well as a bodily injury for the liability limit election form. So those forms will essentially uh, lay out the options that you have in the slides that we have to come uh, to explain the differences and the choices that you have moving along. So Julie, if we want to move on to the next screen, we can get into the liability options. So Michigan has historically had a lower limit that they've required you to have 20,000, 40,000 per accident uh, limit. And now we are increasing that um, to a 250,000 per person or a 500,000 per auto accident liability limit. And typically we see that our commercial accounts do have the bodily injury limit of a million. And there's multiple reasons uh, for doing so. One is that a million dollars is kind of the recommended threshold limit that we have on business auto accounts. In addition to, if you do have an umbrella policy on your business account, that typically is the limit that you must carry on that auto in order for your umbrella policy to respond to that. So the form that you're going to be receiving either from us or from your carrier direct would show would show you the options of having 250 or 500,000 per accident or if you um, want a higher limit you can uh, you can choose a higher limit as well. So that form would just need to be signed and either sent back to us uh, your agent, your account manager, or sometimes the carrier direct gives you gives you a place to send that to. So anybody have any questions on the new limits for liability? Okay, for the next item that we have within the auto reform on each policy, there's a property protection coverage in Michigan. And essentially what this coverage is, is when you have damage to a third party's property. So that might be a parked vehicle, that might be driving off the road and hitting a building, that might be you have a heavy hauler type truck going down the freeway and you hit a state bridge and damage that bridge. Within Michigan, 
the limit for that coverage is a million dollars for repairing those damages to somebody else's property. With the new auto reform uh, that has gone through, they have added an exclusion to that form on your policy, and that exclusion would not allow damages if somebody was driving that was not licensed in Michigan. Now this change came about pretty rapidly and we are uh, speaking with all the carriers at, we might have this form removed from the policies. We're still working with the carriers to see that, but we felt it was definitely an important item to, to point out to everybody that this is a new exclusion within your policies. So if you do have somebody that's not licensed in Michigan and driving your commercial vehicles, then probably should have a talk with your agent or your account manager about that and to see what steps you can take just to make sure that you do have coverage in place should something happen. And I think we can move maybe on to the next slide if there's no questions. Okay, and we'll move on to the personal injury protection limits. This is really the big change I think that everybody's been speaking of and giving Michiganders options to what limits that you want. Traditionally, the personally injured protection limits have been unlimited within your policy, both commercial and uh, personal autos. But with this new change that came about on July 2nd, 2020, they're now giving you the options to have either that unlimited coverage, a $500,000 per person per accident limit, or $250,000 per person per accident limit uh, within the commercial program. So there are some limits available if you're an individual or sole proprietor that might be lower limits. Um, and we're not going to get into those so much today, but uh, it would be a good idea to reach out to your, again, your agent to see if you had, um, if you have that circumstance, you could see what other options you might have. And what does the personal injury protection really do? It's for the medical uh, benefits that are afforded to you in the event of an auto accident. And we also wanted to point out with that, that the, um, the Michigan uh, PIP limits are chargeable in a way where they assess an MCCA fee, which I'm sure most of you have probably heard about that fee. And typically it has been somewhere around the $220 mark for the past number of years. And with this reform, they are lowering that to $100 per year for that fee. Now, uh, with that fee, you will see that savings automatically within your uh, policy renewal when it does come up, um, but that is one charge that is changing along with being able to pick those other limits within the PIP uh, structure. So you could look at a total cost savings to your account um, if you did choose lower limits. But, we're gonna go into the next slide and kind of talk to you about what those personal injury protection limits really afford you and what kind of coverages that you do have. So within the personal injury protection, there are medical expenses that are paid, again, resulting from an auto accident. And there, in addition to just your auto accident related injuries, there are additional things that they cover that are within your plan if you pick that unlimited limit. And those things can be your lost wages from an auto accident. So if you're out of work for an extended amount of time and you need those additional benefits coming into your household, they definitely have those lost wages added in. Um, attendant care services. Now, those are services where you might have uh, physical therapists come into your house, or if you need help, if you're severely injured with normal things like eating, bathing, dressing, grooming, a nurse to take care of your, um, your schedule of medication that you might need, or um, administering uh, doses of medication, things of that nature. That's really what those attendant care services are. 
and we'll get into it a little bit later, but some of those things may or may not be covered by your personal uh, or by your personal insurance plan that you get either through your independent plan or your employer sponsored plan. But we wanted to point out that if you do have the unlimited PIP coverage, it, uh, it does provide those things for you as long as you're being cared for as a result of that accident. A couple other items that we thought were pretty important that PIP also covers is if you need any modifications to your home or to your auto as a result of an injury to an accident. Um, say you are now wheelchair bound and you need to have a ramp put on your home in order to get into your home. You need your front door widened so you can get into your home. You need bedrooms reconfigured you need showers and bathrooms reconfigured because of this auto accident, auto modifications, home modifications, maybe even a van that now is wheelchair accessible. Those are all things that are built in with the PIP coverage and that's where the unlimited coverage comes into effect. You're going to have those for the lifetime of the injury so if you need those years after, that PIP coverage is still going to respond to that. Uh, lastly, we also have mileage reimbursement. And that is, say, again, you have a severe injury and you have a spouse that is now helping take care of you throughout the day or take you to multiple doctor's appointments. You can log and keep track of where you're going and what your mileage is, and there's mileage reimbursement within the PIP coverage. So we just wanted to point out that this PIP coverage, the unlimited uh, limit, does provide you some extra benefits uh, that we think are worth kind of reviewing and thinking about uh, when you're purchasing your PIP limits. Next, we wanted to go into um, a couple of questions that within our team, we either discuss within our team or we've had from insureds wanting to know really how this coverage is going to respond. And if we have full limits, if we pick the 500,000 limits, if we pick the $250,000 limit, we wanted to see maybe how it would respond, how it relates to other, po other policies that you might have or as a whole, how does this affect your auto program? So we wanted to share with you a few scenarios that we had in our office, and we're still exploring answers to some of them, but we thought it was a good, maybe a good message to share that we need to look at these things as a roundabout, um, kind of a full encompassing item for your insurance program and really make sure we're making the right decision for your program based upon your, your specific situation. So the first question we had is what if we choose the lower PIP limits, we don't inform an employee, and we allow personal use on our auto policies, there is an accident, but we only have the $500,000 of coverage. Now, we have looked into it and it seems when there's the $500,000 of coverage, once that $500,000 is exhausted, that is the only policy that is going to respond. So you only have that $500,000 limit. And we wanted to know, could your employee file suit? And if they did file suit, could that be a claim under your employment practices liability? So we were thinking in terms of, if I can go back to that example of being wheelchair bound, if you have an employee that is severely injured within an auto accident, they thought you were working with the unlimited PIP on your auto policy. So they thought that they would have that unlimited PIP for any kind of lifetime injury. And now they found out they had the $500,000 limit. You know, we're exploring if you do that, what what might happen if we don't take the proper precautions and notify your employees and maybe have it in your handbook or something of that nature? Could this be a potential claim for your place of employment as a whole? Yeah, I, I think it's a good point, Kelly. And, you know, the, the overlaying theme on this is, it, I think, 
the reform and the decisions you make surrounding the reform are going to have downstream impacts. It's a, it's a really good example of where insurance is meeting risk management. And so the decisions you make here, you know, you're going to want to kind of back that up with taking a look through your organization and, and, and looking into how might this affect, uh, you know, things like in, in employment practices. Is there a potential gap now created by, by the decision made? And, you know, that's that conversation where I have that conversation with your broker and then we can help riff about the hypotheticals like this and go find answers to, to make sure that no matter what decision is made, there aren't gaps on the other side of it. And one additional item that we, when we look at the gaps and what we're proposing and looking at your whole insurance program, we wanna know if we do need this higher umbrella limit. And again, a, an umbrella is the policy that goes over your general liability limit, your auto liability limit, so if there is suit filed against you and say you have a hundred or excuse me, a million dollar coverage on your auto, but your umbrella is a 5 million and you have a suit that comes in that is 1.5 million, they're going to look at your first your auto policy. Then we're going to look at your umbrella policy. So that's really the purpose of the umbrella policy is to go over your primary policies. But our question was, what if you did have an at-fault accident and the person that you got in the accident with, they had a lower uh, PIP option that they chose or they didn't choose PIP at all. If they filed suit against you, your umbrella policy might come into play where it might respond to that. So really we wanted to make have the question posed of do you have a high enough umbrella limit and maybe do we need to increase that if you have multiple vehicles on the road or a larger fleet or you're a type of fleet that is on the road constantly so that um, is another viewpoint that we wanted to, to look at each insurance program that we have to see if somebody would need more umbrella coverage. And Kelly I'll just add to that um, when we talk about you know, the, the options here and that there may be somebody involved in an accident where the, your company is at fault, they have low or no PIP coverage. Keep in mind a couple of things about the litigious environment surrounding the reform. Um, we expect that there, there's a high probability there could be some, some increase, at least in these first couple of years. It's, it's the unknown, but we expect mm -hmm. that there could be some increase in, in terms of this litigious environment. And the other piece of this is keep in mind that before the reform, uh, lawsuits for damages could be brought for three things, death, disablement, and dismemberment. Those, after, after uh, no fault passed, after 7-2 of this year, the definitions have changed. And, and the three definitions now are, the injury has to be uh, due to an auto accident, it has to impair a bodily function, or it has to affect a person's ability to live a normal life. And so when you consider the change in, in those definitions, consider how broad those are and, and how they might be uh, open to interpretation. Again, it's the unknown, but when we're talking about, you know, potentially looking at higher umbrellas, I think that that change in definition has to be taken into account too. We did have a question um, come in, and I believe it was regarding the first blurb that you guys were talking about. Um, it is asked, if it's an employer vehicle, wouldn't that be the commercial coverage and PIP wouldn't apply? Um, well, we're speaking as if it is, yes, um, if it is an employer vehicle, and we're giving permission to the employee to drive, there's still PIP coverage within the, with, within the commercial account. Um. So each, each part of um, commercial auto policy, you do have PIP limits within that commercial policy. So this is an own, you know, PIP's part of a commercial business account as well as a personal account. So maybe if there's uh, any additional information you want to ask on that question, we definitely could look at a specific example for you if you wanna let Julie know if there's something further we could answer for you on that.
Okay, we'll go on to the next example that we had. And so with these changes, and again, going back to the question of informing maybe your employees that you picked a lower limit than on that unlimited um, and you want to have somebody in your vehicle um, that is maybe not uh, an employee themselves, we wanted to know how coverage would respond. So uh, is, we want to know if there would be a company policy on who is allowed in the vehicle and for what purpose. And from our research, coverage may or may not extend to that non-employee or that non-resident relative of the employee. And what we have found is that, um, so coverage typically uh, would extend to people in the vehicle. And with this new law, we're finding that coverage is going to extend to the employee or any residents living with the employee that are on, in the vehicle. So if it's anyone else, coverage might not apply. So an example would be if we have a home health care worker taking a customer to a doctor's appointment. Say there's an accident and the employee is hurt as well as the customer. Now the employee is going to be covered under workers' compensation when they're working, but we're looking at the customer that's in the vehicle. Or another example would be we have a construction company and they have a project going on and the project manager from their customer, their foreman jumps in the vehicle um, and they're driving around on job sites and inspecting to see how the ongoing work is, is coming along. So again, there's an accident. The driver of the vehicle who's the employee would be covered under the workers' compensation portion. But when we're looking at that foreman of that customer, he's not an employee and he's not a resident relative of the employee. So again, we're gonna be looking to see where coverage is going to respond for them and if that PIP coverage is going to extend to them. So we've been uh, instructed that it may, again, may or may not be within that policy. So that's something you would have to work with your agent on and they would have to work with your insurance carrier on to see really where coverage would apply if you do allow people in the vehicle and for what situations. So is there any questions with that? I know that was kind of a lot of information in a scenario. But the point of us kind of pointing that out is, is that we want to, again, reiterate what kind of situation you might be having with your commercial policies. And when you allow somebody to drive your vehicles, who are allowing in the vehicle? Is it business use? Is it private use when somebody's off the clock if you allow them to take the vehicles home? And again, who is in the vehicle um, might have an effect on how coverage responds. And then our last option that we wanted to think about was that hired and known and owned auto liability exposure that you might have. Now, more than likely, if you have a, a commercial auto policy, you have that hired and non owned auto liability built in. And that might be for your office manager who's running in the, to the bank to make a deposit, or if you have janitorial staff, he had to run to Home Depot to buy something, to fix something in the building, things of that nature. That's really where you have that hired non-auto liability for. So we're looking to see how that responds, how the PIP coverage might respond if you have that scenario. We haven't gotten any direct answers back from our carriers yet, um, but we're definitely working with them again to see how this will play out. It is a new coverage within the state of Michigan. It is changing the way uh, the auto policies will respond. So it's a little bit new territory for us all here in Michigan and we're learning as we go along, but definitely feel free to reach out if you have questions or situations that come up in the future that we might be able to assist with. And we're gonna do our best to see if we can find answers to these items. Okay, and with 
those scenarios, we just wanted to kind of review things to consider when we are looking at your uh, the auto reform changes and the different limits that you are able to choose. We have to look at personally titled vehicles, just making sure that there is that business use that is applicable to that personal auto. And if we can, um, we can uh, have the, the forms completed so we can put that personal auto on the, uh, the business policy. But again, we're just going to look at the limits of liability, your PIP limits, make sure that it is the best choice for that personally titled vehicle. The next item we really want to again look at is that personal use of the company owned vehicles who are allowing in our vehicles and for what reason. And the next item relates that, uh, to that as well for household members uh, that might use any of those company owned vehicles. So if we do have a sales executive who does take a vehicle home, does he have a teenage son that might want to run up to the store? using that vehicle? Do we have a policy in place within our employee structure manual that um, says how we can use those vehicles and is that regularly updated and reviewed with, with your employees? So of course, all of these things, we can look at cost savings, but your increased risks. But Quentin, maybe do you wanna speak on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about it a little bit already, but you know, there's gonna be the, not temptation, but you know, it's going to be enticing to look at choosing lower limits and, and what type of costs that might cost savings that might bring to your business. And we understand that you know this this kind of comes at a time where um, saving anything right now on insurance or in any other area of your organization obviously is critical. You know, this is on the heels of COVID. Uh, there's been a number of downstream impacts to your revenue, more than likely. Um, so you know, you're obviously going to want to look into what can you save with with decreasing your limits, but keep in mind that it is going to come with increased risk downstream across your organization in other areas. We gave the employment uh, practices liability example. We talked a little bit about potentially even the need for higher umbrella limits or at least the consideration of it. And so to, to decrease limits in the, in the face of some of those issues we talked about, I think you just really have to do a detailed cost benefit analysis of how much money will your organization save from taking on decrease limits? Is it really enough to absorb or implement any type of change that can fill a gap that might be left in, a, in another area of your organization? And so, again, we're here to help you riff through those hypotheticals and, and talk through that. But it's it kind of goes back to the beginning of the conversation. You know, if you haven't had your renewal yet, um, it's a good time to really start diving into cost benefit analysis and, and really taking your time uh, with with that consideration. So the other thing we've we've been seeing is you you know keep in mind MCCA fee per vehicle is is dropping. So you're going to see some savings there right at the right from the the, the jump. Um, and the other piece of that is if if there's any rate increases, it'll probably offset that. So you might be looking at you know something that's a little bit closer to flat in terms of renewal pricing. Anyway, um, we haven't been seeing that choosing lower limits is is really bringing any type of exorbitant cost savings, you know, assuming you're not going super low. So at the end of the day, you know, we haven't seen where like the, the cost savings is, is clearly outweighing some type of increased risk. Kelly, you probably agree with that, at least from what we've seen so far, we're only about a month into it, but. Right. Yeah. From what we've seen thus far and it taking a few policies and really just breaking them down um, looking at the raw PIP cost, looking at the MCCA charges, and we haven't seen where it would outweigh that benefit, at least for the fleet size. Maybe if you get into a very large fleet size, it might make sense, and I'm talking probably a hundred vehicle fleet or more, you know, but we haven't really seen that, that much of a cost savings with a smaller fleet, say 20 or less. Yep. So it's your decision, but we are here to help. Okay, and the, the, the next item that we really wanted to touch upon was going back to that PIP coverage. I talked a little bit about the uh, medical benefits that you would receive within the PIP program as it is now versus maybe a personal health plan that you might have. And this is where Stephanie uh, might walk through some of those things with us and kind of discuss the differences between the two. Right, thank you, Kelly. Um, 
I'm Stephanie Grant. I'm an employee benefits attorney uh, with Warner Cross and Judge, as I said, and I specialize in health and welfare plans. So um, although the primary focus of this webinar is on the kind of your commercial auto policies, your fleet auto policies, I did want to touch a little bit about um, some thoughts you should have and things you can consider uh, with respect to any employer sponsored health plan that you may have. Um, and Julie, I don't know if you want to forward to the next slide. I can do that. There we go. There we go. Um, but, and we are doing, uh, Sterling and I are doing another presentation, I believe on August 26th, correct me if yes. I'm wrong, Julie. I'm August, yeah, August 26th, it has more of a benefits focus. Um, but because, uh, you know, as Kelly said, we're looking at like the whole picture here. So you want to review not only your personal auto policies, your commercial fleet policies, um, you know, umbrella and other kind of insurance products that you might have. But another thing you want to consider is how does this new auto reform interact with any employer sponsored health coverage. Um, and as we all know, we've been working under the regime up until July 2nd of this year, where if you are driving or have a vehicle registered in the state of Michigan, you need to have, you will have unlimited PIP coverage. And as we explained, PIP coverage covers medical expenses. It covers a lot of, uh, it covers uh, you know, um, modifications to your house, it covers mileage, it covers a period of lost wages. So PIP covers a lot more than just medical. So one thing we're seeing with employers is now with the ability for their employees as part of their personal auto insurance to opt out or have something less than PIP coverage, um, that does have an impact on employers. And because individuals can now opt out of PIP coverage if they have what we call, or the statute calls qualified health coverage, we are seeing more employees come to their employers asking, hey, are, does your policy, does our insurance with my employer, is it considered qualified health coverage? And for an employer side, qualified health coverage is coverage that has to meet two requirements. One, it cannot limit coverage due to an auto accident. Um, and I want to be clear that a coordination of benefits is not an exclusion. So if you have a plan that says it pays secondary to auto insurance, that's not considered an exclusion. That's just a coordination of benefits. Uh, an exclusion would be our plan doesn't cover auto accidents at all. Or an exclusion would be our plan does not pay for the first $250,000 of medical costs associated with a um, an auto accident. That's an exclusion. So that's the first thing. Your plan can't exclude or limit coverage, and you have to have an annual deductible of um, less than 6000 So if your health coverage excludes or has a high deductible, higher than 6000 you will not be considered qualified health coverage, meaning that your employee who's covered under your plan or their dependents would not then be able to um, opt out of PIP coverage uh, for themselves. So it would kind of force them to elect at least $250,000. And many employers, uh, as I work with clients on this, many employers are considered qualified health coverage, meaning that they don't exclude coverage and their deductibles are pretty low. So in that case, employees can opt for lower coverages, which we're seeing is getting a little bit of risk exposure to an employer's health plan, simply because under the old regime with unlimited PIP, your plan usually was going to pay secondary to auto insurance. And uh, in that case, because auto insurance would pick up all medical costs, it was rarely that your, your coverage would kick in. So we're seeing um, as renewals for insured policies come up and for self-funded plans come up, um, it, employers kind of exploring what their options are. And we can kind of go to that next slide. And we'll go into this in a lot more detail in the August 26th webinar. So um, uh, I think there's uh, we, uh, both my website, the Warriors website, and I think Sterling's website has a link for that. So make sure you sign up and we can kind of explore these more. Um, but generally the options for your insured plans with this new interaction is, do we exclude coverage for injuries? Is that an option? Will our carrier allow us to do that? Um, if you're self-funded, you've got a little bit more flexibility and do we exclude coverage for all injuries as it related for an auto accident? Do we do a partial exclusion like that $250,000 exclusion? But one of the things we're finding uh, in that case is there are some TPAs who cannot administer a partial exclusion. It'd have to be an all or nothing. So even though you might think you might consider that 
as a good financial option for your plan, a good design for your plan. Uh, you might be limited to what your TPA can or cannot do if you have a self-funded plan. So I just wanted to talk about these things at a high level uh, because again, we're kind of looking at the whole picture of your business and what types of risks in different areas you're gonna have to consider and reevaluate um, because this auto reform touches on a lot of things. Obviously, it touches on personal issues, it touches on your commercial accounts, um, your, your fleet accounts, if you've got uh, employer-sponsored, employer-provided vehicles, and then also um, it heavily interacts with your medical insurance as well. Um, so I wanna just give a high level overview of that. And uh, if you'd like to talk more and dive more into this topic, um, we'll be pre presenting that on August 26th. And that was our presentation, but it, does anybody have any questions? I did receive a question that had to do more with um, a personal auto policy. So I don't know if we want to answer this, if you want me to direct it to our personal lines, maybe Stephanie, you can help. Um, it is, can you discuss the pitfalls of, depending on like Medicare coverage when reducing PIP limits to a low limit on personal auto policy? So I'm gonna guess more or less the question is if they have Medicare and they wanna reduce their PIP limits, what is the, um, what's the downfall on that? Uh, that's gonna be more of a personal, probably a personal lines issue mm -hmm. um, because I, I deal with employer sponsored plans. Um, so if you have Medicare, you're generally not on your employer plan but Medicare A or B is one of the things that will be considered qualified health coverage, meaning you can opt out. But I think just from a personal consideration, again, I think you wanna be looking at the whole picture here. Uh, you do have this ability, this ability to elect uh, less of coverages if you have what they call qualified health insurance, which is um, you know, your employer's plan that provides certain limits or maybe Medicare Part A and B, but just remember that employer coverage and Medicare only pay for medical expenses um, and PIP, cover, PIP covers a lot more than just medical expenses. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you need to make the decision that's best for you and your finances, best for you and your family, um, but uh, that's one thing we've been emphasizing with at least my clients who are employers to try to educate their employees um, who are considering getting um, opting out of PIP, sort of what they'd be giving up and just making sure that they know that. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Dave, I will go ahead and I will direct your question over to our personal lines as well, just so we can get that answered. Does anybody else have any questions? I did want to mention that I did record this, so that will be available. And then I also will attach the slides that we had um, with the recording and I can send it over to all the participants and then it will be available on our website and I will send it over to Stephanie as well, just available to her clients. Um, but does anybody have any other questions for us? Okay, I'm not seeing anything come in. Just had a couple thank yous. So uh, with that, if nobody has any other questions, um, you can also email us. You can email me, I'm the one that sent out the Zoom meeting and I can direct your questions over to Kelly, Quinton, or Stephanie if we didn't get them answered today. And then we also do have another auto reform webinar that's gonna focus more on employee benefits aspect of it. And that will be on August 26th at 1 p.m. as well. And that invite will be sent out later today, if not tomorrow. Okay. Well, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Have a good day.